Most people would say this is an air cooler and this is a water cooler. Is that the right way to think about it? Let's find out. Welcome to Gadget Blues. This is KC, and today we are going to talk a little bit about PC CPU cooling. One inspiration for this particular video is that Cooler Master recently released a small closed loop liquid cooler that uses only a 92 millimeter fan. And it was tested by Hardware Canucks, and they said, hey, this thing doesn't perform as well as an average air cooler. But we hope that Cooler Master will continue to refine it and a future version may perform better. Well, that really isn't going to happen, at performing better. And the limitation is in the size of the radiating area. So I wanted to explain how that matters and what the real difference is between so-called air cooling and water cooling on PCs. All of these things are radiators. There are only three ways that heat travels. One is conduction, that's direct from the CPU to the heat sink. The other is convection, which only happens if you're using a system without a fan at all. That's the air moving by itself because it heats up, rises, and cooler air takes its place. And then radiation, which is what all of these things actually do. They radiate the heat into the air in the form of infrared and the Fans move air through the heat sink in order to move that hot air out and move new cool air in. So they're all radiators, whether they have water in them or not. Now, I'm not going to get pedantic and say that you should change the terms you use to talk about PC cooling. You can call a LED TV an LED TV if you want, as long as you understand at the root level that it is in fact an LCD TV with an LED backlight, because otherwise you would be awfully confused between LED TV and OLED TV. The reason I want you to think about them all as radiators is because the big differentiator between all of these products is the size and material of the radiating surface, not whether it has water in it or not. The reason that the size of the radiating surface matters so much is because heat only travels so far efficiently through metal before it just starts to concentrate and get hotter rather than moving farther away. And that's why if you have a pan with boiling water on it on your stove with a metal handle, you can still hold this comfortably without it being red hot. And here's the absolutely key concept. Water is an inferior conductor to aluminum or copper. Why do we use it? Only to move the heat from the source out to the radiating surface. And that becomes an advantage only if the radiating surface is significantly larger or better than the one that you could bolt directly to the CPU itself. That's why the Cooler Master 92 millimeter closed loop cooler is a bad idea because it's not larger than the cooler that you could bolt directly to the CPU. Now these water radiators are a little bit more efficient for their size than one that just has heat pipes because if you look at this it has four heat pipes on either side, but this has essentially 12 because each one of these lines here is a water pipe that is functionally equivalent to a heat pipe in moving the heat around. So even though this particular radiator is smaller than this air radiator, it still performs fairly similarly. But the water radiator is only slightly more efficient per size. Say you can have a water radiator about two-thirds the size of a uh, air-to-air and it will perform on par, all other things being relatively equal. Right now in PC cooling you've got basically three classes of coolers. There is the single material cooler. This is used in really low-end, low thermal design power applications. This is just a solid aluminum piece with fins on it. Nothing fancy about this whatsoever, but it's only good for low wattage parts. Then the next step up is you have a device with heat pipes. This is the first mechanism where we have different materials and it's used to move the heat away from the CPU into a larger radiating surface just in the way that water does in the third type. 
water cooling units, which have a pump that is either on the radiator or on the CPU itself, moves the water through these hoses, which are closed. That's why this is called a closed loop cooler or an all-in-one cooler. The step up from this, while remaining in the same category of water cooling, is the open water cooling system where each part is separate. You buy them a la carte and put them together in the order that you want. In these closed loop coolers, there is a good deal of complexity. You have the embedded pump in the cool block. You have the hoses and fittings, and all of this adds failure points to your computer. I'm not saying that these are unreliable. A lot of companies have been making these now for years, and they have refined them to the point where they are a very reliable system as these things go. But because of the number of components and the failure points, they are inherently less reliable than a basic air cooler, which only has one moving part, the generic 120 millimeter fan or fans that you can buy in any computer store or electronic store anywhere in the world. These components are all proprietary. If the pump goes out, you have to replace the entire unit if it's out of warranty. This particular fan is also proprietary, and so this is a lot of stuff that you have to throw out when it fails. And when it fails, hopefully it doesn't do so catastrophically and let any water out that would cause some of your other components to fail. I'm not picking on Antec specifically. This is just an example of a closed-loop cooler. Now, the reason I bring up this reliability issue is in order to make this compromise, this sacrifice, and going with something that has more failure points and is inherently less reliable, you need to get something in return. You need to get better cooling performance than you would have otherwise. And if you're going with a water cooler that only has a radiator that is efficient as a typical air radiator, then you aren't getting something in return for all this complexity and potential extra cost. That leads me to PC CPU cooling tip number one. If you are going with water cooling, a closed loop cooler system, you wanna go for a 240, that is 220 millimeter fans, at a minimum because you're getting better performance at this point than your typical air cooler. Water cooling by itself is not magic. The size of the radiating surface is the important part and the water is only there to move the heat to a bigger radiator than you could have bolted directly to the CPU. As I said before, you can bolt a pretty big cooler directly to the processor, but you can't bolt one this big on there. So uh, 240 is about the minimum that I would recommend in a closed loop cooler. That philosophy leads directly into the open loop system, where if you're going to go with open loop, which is even less reliable than closed because you're putting together all the fittings yourself and there are many more points of failure, then you need to get even better cooling performance to offset that level of complexity. And so don't build a open loop system with the same size radiator that you could get in a closed loop system. That's tip number two. If your computer case can't handle a really large radiator, then stick with closed loop cooling or get a bigger case because you want to make those trade-offs where it counts. And if you get a pretty substantial 360 radiator, then you are getting returns on investment that make open loop cooling start to pay for itself in terms of quiet operation because the fans can operate at lower RPM and total cooling capacity where the amount of water in this system will absorb a lot of peaks in your CPU performance without overheating. If you can fit a radiator that takes 140 millimeter fans instead of a 120, even better because the larger the diameter of the fan for the same airflow, the quieter the operation. A lot of folks these days are building water cooling systems that use these rigid tubing designs that are really pretty. They have lots of lighting and different color fluids going through them and so forth. And that is incredibly pretty and it's a design statement and so forth, but it prohibits you from doing easy upgrading and changes in your system. In fact, I wouldn't even run one of those with say dual video cards unless I had a motherboard like the Asus ROG series that had little switches and dip switches on it that can disable 
PCIe slots because if my graphics started failing, I wouldn't know which card is at fault without pulling it out and you can't pull it out because it's all locked in by rigid tubing. When the next CPU comes out and you're like, oh, that looks exciting, uh, that new CPU, it's got more cores, it's got better performance. Oh, but geez, I would have to change my motherboard and the motherboard has the socket in exactly this spot. If I got a new motherboard, it would be in a different spot and I'd have to redo all my tubing and that prevents you from upgrading or at least gives you pause before you decide to do that. I know it's really pretty. Uh, I love that those systems exist, but if you are a genuine hardcore hardware fanatic that changes things around all the time and is always upgrading to the next greatest thing, I don't think that rigid tubing design is for you. I'm sure there are some folks that relish the thought of breaking out the torch and bending their acrylic tubing and making a whole new configuration every time a new platform comes out. But personally, I would rather be actually using the system and playing games with that time instead of fiddling with it every time I get a new motherboard. If you've ever raced motor vehicles, you know that the person you have to worry about at the track is not the guy who has an engine covered in chrome. It's the guy that has the best latest components with the best performance, even if it doesn't look fancy. Right now, I think the sweet spot for our cooling is in the 240 closed loop cooler. There's a ton of competition in this segment. The prices have come down quite a bit. The units are high performant and reliable. So that's what I would go to in the majority of situations. If you're going with that open loop custom loop solution, then you really want a big radiator like this 360 that I showed you at the minimum, but even better if you can fit something larger, either inside or outside of your case. There are some big radiators available. This one is an example of a fairly large radiator that you would probably need to mount outside of your case. That's how I used it. But this isn't the biggest thing that you can run. To paraphrase Crocodile Dundee, this isn't a radiator. This is a radiator. This one, German made unit, takes 480 millimeter fans, also available in a nine by 120 arrangement. Takes a couple of liters of coolant and it wall mounts. So I used Coolant's quick disconnects to attach this to the system in case I needed to pull the machine out for maintenance or upgrades. Downsides are kind of obvious, it's huge and you have to bolt it to the wall and it's pretty expensive. But the upside is it has huge thermal capacity and you hardly have to run the fans at all. So it's almost dead quiet for even a really high-end system. You can run multiple graphics cards and a high-core CPU through this without it breaking a sweat whatsoever. So to sum up my philosophy and recommendations, the 120 millimeter heat pipe air cooler is the best price performance in almost all systems, even those that are mildly overclocked. It's a better deal, especially in the higher-end versions, than the 120 millimeter closed-loop all-in-one coolers. If you're going with a really high performance system or you want extra quiet operation, then your closed loop cooler with a 240 radiator is the minimum that I would recommend to bother with the closed loop type system. Then if you're going to go with the full on custom loop, I recommend a really big radiator at a minimum a 360 to make all of that extra effort and complexity worthwhile in terms of cooling performance. Those are my overall thoughts on CPU cooling performance and devices. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something. So please like and subscribe and we will see you in the next Gadget Blues. Keep it cool, folks.